Welcome to Real Gardens on a nice, lovely spring morning in Norfolk. Every week we're going to be visiting three gardens and seeing how they develop and hopefully lending a hand as the season progresses. This week we've got a couple of new real gardeners to meet. Carol Klein visits a garden in Devon, owned by a pair of police officers with a passion for plants. Oh, no! Anne-Marie Powell is in demolition mode with a young mother in London who wants to transform her urban back garden into a children's paradise. And I'm back in Norfolk helping Bryony Jacklin with the huge task of creating a three-acre garden out of overgrown farmland. Lisa Jacobson bought her terraced house in Harrow two years ago from her mother who'd been renting it to tenants. She moved in with her husband Dominic and their daughter Sophia. Since then, there's been an addition to the family in the form of baby Grace. Sophia loves the garden. She's always running up and down and the path with her toys. And if I ever do any weeding, you know, she's more than happy to help me. Grace is a bit too young. She's only five months, so I'll, I'll teach her. She'll learn. <laughs> Lisa was pregnant for most of last summer, so she hasn't had much opportunity to work on her small, very narrow back garden, and there are some areas that she's distinctly embarrassed about. My main interest is trying to keep the plants alive. <laughs> so I've killed these, and every time I look out into the garden, my, my soul is, is uh, aching because I see dead plants, and I can't believe I've done that to them. <laughs> My husband Dominic has absolutely no interest in the garden. He allows me to get on with it. But whatever he has done in the garden, I've been like horrified. For example, the back gate, which he promised me he would put up. He also attempted to put some trellis up for me. And instead of drilling it into the wall, uh, he hung it with some string onto the gutter. And I was devastated. I was like, excuse me, that is not how you put trellis up. So he's banned from the garden. <laughs> in order to change her boring back garden into the child-friendly paradise that she really wants, Lisa needs to help. It's the perfect job for our garden. Oh, it's sunny, isn't it's it? It's beautiful. Do you know which way it faces? It's a west-facing garden. Is it always as sunny as this, too? Yeah. We haven't really done that much to it. I've started to create something here, but... And what about this concrete? Because it's really flat, isn't it? Yeah. Initially, what I thought maybe decking, because it would be smoother and more natural for Changing my mind about that. <laughs> I'm not being rude, but everyone seems to be thinking of decking, decking at the moment, yeah. don't they? Yeah. I mean, I, I would like to use um, Gaudi as, as some sort of source of inspiration in the garden. Right. Because um, my husband and I were in Barcelona last year, and, and the park is, is fantastic. And I, I quite like that, the mosaics and all of the sort of Mediterranean feel. So that's the sort of vibe you want to yeah. get out of it, really. Yeah. Just being abroad. I mean, it's so hot and yeah. sunny here, yeah. isn't it? Lisa's biggest problems lie concealed at the end of the garden. Behind the two wooden panels looks a terrible mess. But there's also the problem of security, since the garden is connected to an alleyway by this dodgy looking door, which Dominic still hasn't got around to replacing. So before we can get creative, we've got some demolition to do. Dom, what can learn? With a new frame in, the hinges in place and the gate hung, it doesn't take long before Lisa's security worries are over. You'll be able to sleep at night now, won't you? Fantastic. Does it make you feel better? Absolutely. Lovely, secure gate at last. Now the back wall is secure, it's time to decide what stays and what goes. We can start by getting rid of the two screens Lisa erected to hide the junk at the end of the garden. There's an unpruned and unidentified clematis which we're going to have to move. But first, we're going to dig the hole for its new position. I reckon if we put it sort of about here, because mm -hmm. this type of will shade its roots in like that, so oh, right, okay. if we put it about there, let's do quite a big hole. Take a look. <laughs> 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 you've done a lot of laundry now. No, nothing too physical. You can stay on board. Shall I have a go? Yeah, yeah. you go for it. Clematis likes to have its roots in the shade, and the hypericum will keep the ground and the roots underneath it nice and cool. Did you say you had some compost? Yes, I stole some from my mother. Nicked it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Put that a bit more. Okay, quite a lot, and that'll actually make it more moisturising, but it won't kill the plant. Can we use bone meal? Yeah, we can. Put a bit of that in. I'll mix it up. Bone meal is rich in phosphates, which will feed the roots. Right. I reckon we should. Uh, Get the plant out and get it in the hole then there. Have you ever pruned it? No, I've not been frightened to. Can you see there's a couple of buds here on yeah. 
Yes, coming up through. Right. So I want to cut it as low down as we possibly can. It's just there. Can you see? You cut it about there. You won't kill it. Right. And what will happen is it will start to sprout from the base then. Do you want to cut this? Yeah, I'll let's have a go. It's your plant, so if it yeah. dies, it'll okay. be all <laughs> So if you just cut it above there. Above there? Yeah, mm -hmm. at a slight angle. Just go for it. Yeah. And I can't see any buds on here at all, so I think we'll do a bit of an experiment because it's, it's been split. Yeah. yeah. So maybe cut it down quite low, actually. Okay. And see if it regenerates. Like right there? Yeah. Excellent. So look at all this. We can pull all this off now. Oh, God. That's... <laughs> There's nothing left, is there? <laughs> okay. Unless this clematis is a late flowering variety, it's unlikely to bloom this year. But as long as we keep the root ball as big as possible, it won't suffer from being moved. God, it's heavy. Can you just uh, yeah. get that hand to hand? Mm -hmm. Marvellous. I reckon a good drink now. <laughs> It's not for you. <laughs> we get lots of water on this, or just that whole can. Whole can. Yeah. This will mix yeah. all the soil and compost together. Put that back, and that will just shade all those roots, and it'll be more than happy. So should we try and get this out? Yes, please. Because it'll open it up, won't yeah. it? And then you yeah. have no excuses to hide stuff behind yeah. it. Sledgehammer, yeah. Wrecking bar, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Look at that. <laughs> now that the panels have gone, Lisa and I can start thinking about how to bring more colour and better structure to this garden. Next time, we've got to start making something rather than wrecking everything. <laughs> Let's get more creative, lovey. <laughs> yeah. Brani Jacqueline works in her Norfolk garden almost every day of the week. She and her husband Martin and their four children live in an old farmhouse surrounded by three acres of rough pasture, which Brani has almost single-handedly transformed into a garden. The family moved here after Martin was attacked by intruders in their London home and was left with a broken spine. They now have to live on his disability allowance. Brani is keen to improve the view from Martin's room. Where there were two lawned areas separated by a gravel drive, the plan is to remove a section of the drive, join up the lawns, and create two new herbaceous borders on either side. Last week, Brownie's son, Christopher, and I helped her with some of the digging, but she's been hard at it ever since, and all that now remains is to lay the new turf. Hello. This is very impressive. It's been a lot of hard work. <laughs> Did you do it yourself? My father helped me for one day, and Christopher did a bit at the weekend. But uh, it was very, very hard. But worth it, because look, it looks good. Yeah, you get the picture now. Well, I can see that, because when I came in, I looked from Martin's window, and you do see this funnelling effect, and the mulberry tree is at the centre, and these flanking boards, yeah. and so fully planted. Well, yeah, things have survived quite well, considering they were in plastic bags for the week, and um, there are salvias, red-hot pokers, so it's going to be kind of spring shrub based and then perennials will take over in the summer. So our job is going to be to turf this one. Yeah. Right. Turfing, we shall go. Right. Brownie has already prepared the ground, finally raking it and firming it down to get a level surface for the turf. She's also taking great care to plan out the curved edges of the lawn, especially around the base of this mulberry tree. What sort of turf is this? It's 60% uh, rye, so it's going to give it really hard wearing. Yeah. And 40% uh, fescue mix. Have you laid much turf? No. I mean, the basic rule, as you know, is you always go over the joints. Yes. And where you have two together, you don't just butt them up against each other like that, but you do slightly overlap them. 
like that, and yeah. then you push, push them, down. them down. You want to keep it as tight as possible, because inevitably they shrink until they grow together. The turves were cut and delivered three days ago, and the warm weather has meant that some of them have started to dry out, especially along the edges. It's important that we get them laid out and watered as quickly as possible. So, while the children look after themselves, we're cracking on. Why don't you stand on the grass? Because grass is soft. Right. And the ground's hard. And what will happen is it has no resistance, so your heel or the side of your foot will make a divot or an imprint. Right. And then the grass will grow to that shape. You shouldn't walk on it for at least two weeks and more like four. Really? Yeah. The important thing is, is this is all done to look at, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So he's the only one that's going to appreciate the view, because the rest of us are going to be There's dancing around the mulberry. <laughs> <laughs> Once all the turves have been laid, Brownie's artistic flair comes into play, not with her paintwork, but in creating the curved edges to her new lawn, oh, which she can cut away with a kitchen knife. I think the really important thing is to saturate this grass now because it was very dry mm -hmm. underneath, so the soil wants to be wet, the grass wants to be wet. Have you got a sprinkler? Uh, no, only me, and uh, I might do a rain dance. Well, you need rain. Rain would help. Mm. OK, so other than watering it, which two of us can't do, that's it. No, I, oh, I'm no, off. no, 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 no. <laughs> I've got another little job in mind. Quick one? Yeah? Ish. Thank you. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Round the back of the house are the three second-hand greenhouses that Bryony uses to propagate all her plants. Amongst the hundreds of seedlings and cuttings are some plants which badly need a home. Yeah. Now, this is embarrassing. Um, these begonias and osteosperms are yeah. to go in the ramp outside Martin's room. Right. It's a very hard bit of concrete, so it's going to soften the edges. So what's embarrassing? Well, they've been hanging about for a year and a half, and they're, they're really... Root bound. Poor thing. But that doesn't matter. Beginnings are as tough as old boots, aren't well, they? They'll need to be where they're going. What about the osteosperms? Well, Did you... they, um, I mean, they're quite leggy, but they can be planted a bit deeper. So you are amazing the way that you do propagate everything. You've got all these plants here, all of which you've raised for practically nothing. You're an inspiration, you are. Oh, no, it's probably just my obsessive character. <laughs> well, you're an obsessive inspiration. <laughs> yes, totally obsessive. All right, well, let's take them and we'll get them into the ground. I'll come back and pick those up. OK, so we're, we're going all along the edge here, are we? Yes, I'm just going to leave a, a bit of a gap because there's undoubtedly um, a footing here. So we'll okay. scrape a bit away and have a look. All right. Marty's ramp was only put in three months ago and its concrete foundations and the compacted soil alongside it are proving difficult to dig out. Have you got a pickaxe? I've got a handle. A handle? Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> I haven't got a pickaxe, I've got a pickaxe handle. <laughs> Despite the lack of proper tools, a bit of brute force and hard digging is enough to produce a trench about eight inches deep, which we can fill with topsoil from one of Brownie's vegetable beds. Yeah. Now, how do you want these planted? Alternately? A, a little group of one and then a few of the others. I don't want an equal set of each. OK. Next spring, the pale pink of the Virginia and the deeper pink of the Osteospermum should make a spectacular display along this ramp. So why did you choose this combination? Firstly, they're evergreen, and then they're going to flower from spring through to the first frosts, or even longer. Uh, it's a hostile spot, and they're very hardy, the pair of them. And I've got repeats elsewhere in the garden, so it kind of echoes the theme. Good, I love that. After the break, Carol Klein is off duty with a couple of police officers who, when they're not fighting crime, are busy planting up their sloping garden in Devon. Welcome back. Brownie has got this great big hosta that she wants to move for the new beds. And now's a good time of year to do it. You can see that the purple crowns are just starting to appear. In different varieties, they come out at different times. This one's pretty late. Of course, they'll make those fabulous leaves that come in a month or so. And hostas 
are very easy to divide up. And if you're going to move it, this is perfect time. And all you need to do is chop them. And I tend to do start off in four. So on an old one, the roots are going to be pretty tough. You could subdivide that up to as many crowns as there are, but each piece must have a crown attached to a piece of root. However, for Bryony, this is fine. We're gonna plant out these four, and there'll be four whopping great hostas growing with extra lustiness and vigor. Now, Carol has gone to meet a couple of police officers who live on the edge of Dartmoor, who spend most of their free time in their steeply sloping garden. It's looking absolutely fantastic, isn't it? Adrian and Debbie Taylor bought their Devon bungalow just after they got married three years ago. Their house has spectacular views over Dartmoor, and the garden falls steeply down to a little stream, a millweed, which runs along the boundary. They've already built a raised deck, the full length of the house, and they've made a start on the garden, but they don't always agree on what they want to have in it, especially when it comes to Adrian's favourite plant, Budlia. If I want to have a garden full of Budlia, well, so be it. It's beautiful. Yeah, you had to get that in, didn't you? <laughs> See, I would disagree with the Budlia side of things. I don't, want bu I don't want a garden full of Budlia. I think we should have his and her gardens. I think we should separate it down the middle, possibly. That might be an idea. And I can have all the plants I want on my side and all the plants that you want on your side. No. No, not a good idea. Adrian and Debbie are both police officers and they have to fit gardening in between shifts on the beat. Debbie is now working part-time so she can spend more time with her baby Emily. Over the past year, they've put an enormous amount of energy into gardening, planting up different areas and landscaping the steep bank beneath their house. But they now realise they have made some bad mistakes with their planting and they really need help. This is where Carol Klein comes in. Wow, Ray, what a view! That's fantastic! It's absolutely incredible, isn't it? It's the main reason why we moved here. Yeah, we looked at the view and said we'd buy it before we even looked at the house. It was just, we knew it would be right yeah. for us. Well, let's have a look at the rest of the garden then. It really is quite big, isn't it? But it's all long. Yeah, it's about a quarter of an acre altogether. Yeah. Um, but as you can see, we've got this huge bed here, which is exceptionally steep. Yeah, but it's very repetitive, dare I say. I can see about 20 of the same hardy geranium up yeah. and down, and rather a lot of buddleias too. We did, went to a plant auction a couple of years ago and it yeah. did quite well. We, we bought some job lots of certain items. Right. So, um, In how many at a time? Ten at a time. Oh, yeah, lots of, yeah, 30. 30? <laughs> So everything's planted in tents? Everything, yeah, and I'd, uh, not yeah. a single thing got wasted. They all went in. Is that your philosophy, wasting up one lot? Absolutely right. <laughs> and are you happy with it like it is? No, we've definitely got to get, get the planting um, situation sorted out here. It's just not right. It doesn't do it any justice at all. I have to say, it needs a bit more rhythm yeah. and movement and a bit of careful thinking. I think we've definitely got to do something with this um, garter's grass. Gardener's garters, yeah. It's popping up absolutely everywhere, isn't it? And it's an extremely invasive plant. I mean, it's decorative, but yeah, you can have too much of a good thing, <laughs> can't you? But let's have a look at this leet. It's um, really running rapidly. And look at this lithic item, this skunk cabbage. Yeah. It's a North American plant, but it looks perfectly at home, doesn't it? It's wonderful, and it becomes absolutely huge. Mm. You've got all this beautiful native stuff all around you, haven't you? These yes. wonderful hedges and trees, it's just beautiful. The first job we have to tackle is that main bed. So whilst Adrian and Debbie dig out some of the invasive gardener garters, I've dug out my watercolours to do a planting plan. I'm grouping plants of the same variety together in broad swathes of colour. Do you want to look? <laughs> Oh, wow. Hey, wow, that looks good. <laughs> I've decided to christen it the banana bed because that's just what it's like, a sort of rather bash banana. So I've tried to kind of design it so you've got these big swathes of plants that cut across that. And actually, most of the stuff on here is in this bed somewhere Excellent. or other. With the exception of a couple of candidates. Like, um, it's a buddly of free zone. Oh, it's all right. I've already shame. worked out where they're going to go. I knew it was coming, so yeah. uh, I'm resigned to it. So you're not bothered? No. Good show. Do. These little grey dots on here yeah. are oh, yeah. supposed to be, you know, your Iroko 
fence at the top. Maybe oh, the retaining wall, yeah, yeah. yeah. If you could use some little bits of that and maybe make a few slightly retaining walls in here, but just a few inches. Yeah. That sounds good. High, and they could establish that kind of rhythm. And then if you do a lot of your planting, not in strips, but in big blocks of one thing, so you get some kind of impact. We need to start with a blank canvas. So after all of Debbie and Adrian's hard work, we have the painful task of pulling it all up. It's a huge job, so we're limiting ourselves to a small section, which will give them an idea of how to use the planting plan. OK, I'm going up to the planting now. Adrian's taking our plants up to some holding beds. It's important to get the plants back into the ground as soon as possible to stop them drying out. These geranium macrorhizum will be the first to go into the new bed. Is this, this is a new planting plan? The, the, it the, is. The smelly geranium. Oh. Careful with that bud leaf, please. <laughs> That's one's been in the family for a generation. <laughs> What's it's an delicate. heirloom? It's a, oh. Oh. Look. <laughs> Aid. Aid, look, let this be a token of my love to you. Here you are. <laughs> a present. <laughs> Just like it's always <laughs> oh no, that's horrible. We're giving the area a good digging over and clearing it of bindweed. Meanwhile, Adrian's busy cutting down his precious buddleias so he can replant them. He's determined not to ditch one root. All over your garden you've got these salt-seeded forget-me-nots. Oh, they're lovely, aren't they? Yeah, and on the plan I've put some of them together. Oh nice. So we'll try and lift them up. You've even yeah. got them in the paths in places. Yeah. So if we get a whole load of them together, you can have a great big swathe of blue. I think that'll look really nice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the man with the mock. Yeah. Brilliant. What do you think of this, then? Looks brilliant. Looks like just we started for three years ago. <laughs> That's not even funny. <laughs> but beautifully cultivated now, and all those plants have grown, and you're going to put them back yeah. with a little design sure. this time. Yeah. Yeah. Right. To mark out the curves of the little Iroko fence, we're following the planting plan using some bamboo sticks. And then we're going to plant this um, pink geranium, this geranium macrorhizum in front of it to get you off to a flying start. To connect the formal area around the house to the countryside beyond, we're using informal plants that look at home in natural surroundings. These soft silvery stachyspizantina will look gorgeous alongside the pink flowers of the geraniums. All they need now is mulching and watering in. Well, I think that's about it. We've, we've done about a twentieth of it and I'm completely tired out. Oh, Next brilliant. time I come, yeah. Is it all going to be done, do you reckon? Yep, it yeah. will be done. Well, that's it for this week. Next week, Carol will be in Suffolk, helping Diana Harold to make a path through her jungle. Anne-Marie is weaving wattle up in Stockport with Mike and Alison. And Bryony and I plan to go to the seaside to get some wild inspiration. I'll see you then. Bye-bye.